everyone. Welcome to the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast. I am Ray, your audiobook reviewer, and I'll be reviewing some recent and classic Lit RPG audiobooks for you. Uh, what I would like to do before we start is to apologize. Uh, this is going to be a short show. Uh, my work schedule has been insane the last three weeks. It has been a struggle to get time to actually record uh, these episodes. I've listened to a ton of books. But just to sit down and do the recordings, it has been nearly impossible. Every time I have tried, I have been called out or I have worked uh, an insane number of hours. I mean, I've been working more than more hours than I ever have. I think I've hit about 95 hours this week alone. Uh, so I apologize for that. It will be short this evening. Uh, and I will wish you a happy new year ahead of time. So happy new year, everybody. Uh, today, I am going to be beginning with Conquest. The Dungeon Core Gambit, Book 1, by Anthony W.F. Chow, narrated by Camille Dubois, with a book length of 10 hours and 21 minutes. Marcus slowly regained awareness. He tried to open his eyes, but couldn't. Where am I? He tried to open his eyes again, and failed. It was as if his eyes no longer existed. He tried to flex his fingers. Again. Nothing happened. His mind, panicking now, he tried to move his body. Yet he felt nothing. He screamed. He heard nothing. What happened to me? When his panic left his body some time later, Marcos reached out with his mind. He soon discovered his thoughts were floating in a dark pool, teeming with energy. It felt cold and warm at the same time. His existence had changed. He slowly remembered the last thing he felt. Overwhelming pain. So, Conquest is a book that is, I don't know, it's, it's sort of very confused for what it wants to be. It's a book that feels like a Dungeon Core book when you first hear about it and you start into the story itself. But then it doesn't act like a Dungeon Core book. Uh, it basically starts off with a guy from our world being murdered in a pretty hardcore fashion. I think uh, Chow might just be a big fan of Lorena Bobbitt because his assassin sure as heck makes sure the MC lives out a John Wayne Bobbitt scenario prior to his death. And if you don't know who I'm talking about, kids, don't look it up. It's not nice, it's not fun, and it's horrifying. And yeah, John Wayne uh, Bobbitt he's not the big cowboy guy at all, uh, but he did go on to star in some porno movies after uh, his incident. So I guess there is a semi-happy ending after this, uh, but I don't think it would be all that happy one way or the other. But anyway, the, the MC gets reborn as a dungeon core in another world, and he immediately starts making monster friends, absorbing people, and growing his territory. Uh, he does it a little too quickly for my taste, and we'll go into that. The story flips between dungeon building and sex scenes, which it kind of more goes into that than anything else, since the world has a dearth of viable males to support the female population. Now, I'm not sure if this is originally something that started out as a naughty book that evolved into a dungeon core book, uh, or if it was a dungeon book that evolved into an erotic book, And it's but it's really hard to tell what the focus was on, because... Half the time, it was more about the sex and, and, and that than, than it was actually about the dungeon growing. And I have no problem whatsoever with sex scenes, but I do need a really solid story behind it. Uh, you know, just, just as an example, right now I'm in, I'm in the middle of Dan the Barbarian, an intensely powerful book that has sex involved in it. And the sex does not overwhelm the story. It enhances it. So here... Uh, it's not quite that way. I mean, honestly, there's times that I think this was just about sex or, uh, I don't know, somebody getting in their fun by writing these scenes because it sure wasn't about, to me anyway, the dungeon core doing what a dungeon core is supposed to do. Like I say, I've read hair in books and I'm no prude, but this was not my cup of tea sex-wise. Not at all. Now, my issues with the story are thus. Let me list them for you. First, the book never really delivers a challenge to the main character, the Dungeon Core. He pretty much overcomes or outthinks any obstacle in his way. And the best way I could say this is, he's got a really, really, I don't want to call it neat or smart or slick. He has a cheat that is just kind of thrown in there that allows him to do pretty much anything he wants. He'll never run out of mana. He has limitless mana. 
And because of that, the dungeon core is able to actually, you know, evolve and grow faster than a regular dungeon. So, you know, I, I don't think that there was ever a point where I said, oh, geez, is something really bad going to happen to him? Because that already happened in the first, you know, chapter of the book. The really horrible stuff happened. After that, there was never a concern. I never worried about him or it, whatever you consider a dungeon core to be, at all. Never. Uh, secondly, the, the way the story explains the dungeon cores, uh, they basically say the dungeon cores need to keep themselves hidden and secret. Keep it secret. Keep it safe. You know, Gandalf, that was his little admonition to, to wee little Frodo, right, as he, as he went off to check to see. Because, you know, Gandalf doubted, actually, that that was a ring of power. He thought it was one of the lesser rings. And he thought Frodo was cool, you know, keeping it in his, his little envelope in his, his cottage here. Um, and when he found out what it was, he freaked out. Well, here, it's sort of like that. You know, keep it secret, keep it safe, or you'll be destroyed. But pretty much every person or thing that the Dungeon Corps encounters via his... Uh, how do I term this? His vessels, because he absorbs people and then puts them out there. They're kind of like replicas of the person mentally and physically. Uh, and they operate as if they were that person, but it's still the core because they have a minor core inside. It, it gets a little complicated with the number of cores that get made. Um, but everybody that meets the dungeon knows it's a dungeon. It's really weird. Like the first thing that the dungeon's companion says is, is, Keep yourself secret or you're going to get whacked or people will take you and da da da. And then everybody he meets, well, you know, I work for the Dungeon Core or I am the Dungeon Core or it was weird. It was really, really strange that it would do that after that big ad admonition. So I don't know. Um, it was just bizarre how that worked out. Third, he expands his dungeon really fast. I mean, most Dungeon Core books take time building rooms and levels and adding monsters and traps and everything. Well, hell, the dungeon expands its territory and its range by leaps and bounds. Incredibly huge leaps and bounds. Um, there, you know, and I don't even want to say he added monsters because that's just not actually what he did. Um, and, and it was just weird how fast that the, 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 the Dungeon Core grew his dungeon. I mean, it was a huge dungeon by the end of the book. And I'm not talking, like, uh, kilometers. I'm talking uh, basically continental size dungeon at that point. And I might be exaggerating a little bit, but not really so much. I mean, it was a huge dungeon by the end of the book. The next thing is the Core's helper was either extremely, deliberately obtuse... Or it was a savant because she kept constantly goofing things up, doing things the wrong way, oopsing here and there. And then all of a sudden, poof, she was like a master in the way that she did things. It just made no sense. It was just a, such a complete flip and there was no explanation for it. I could see like if he had had gained some sort of a, a level that said, okay, at this point your, your companion actually becomes more intelligent because of this, and then she started acting like she did, that would have been very sensible when I said, okay, I get that. That never happened. Not a bit. And it was just really weird how that was. Now, fifth, there were literally no monsters in the dungeon, or sixth, whatever this is. No dungeons, no no monsters in the dungeon. I mean, I grant you, um, that's what's fun about the dungeon genre, new monsters. You know, if you read Divine Dungeon, there's rabbits with horns on her head and that sort of stuff. Uh, slimes in, in the slime dungeon. I wanted to see more done with the nematode or the queen ant, uh, but new, no, new, no, did not happen. And there was actually only one party of adventurers, one real party of adventurers, who take on the dungeon as a dungeon. And they mostly quit before they're even halfway through. I mean, what does it say when a band of adventurers, you know, hi-ho, off to slay we go, uh, don't even want to do a dungeon run? Uh, and actually, there was actually, I think, one member of the group, and I'm trying to remember exactly who it was. It was a thief, I think, who just kind of boogies through the whole dungeon by himself after a while. Uh, I don't know. Uh, that was just strange, 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 strange. Uh, then there was even, for me, there was a grammar issue in an audiobook. Uh, and this is just me being picky, but I have to call out something when I hear it. The word dwarfuses 
is used a lot, which comes a lot out a lot like dwarfesses. Okay, um, dwarfesses is meaning to be the plural of female dwarves. All right, uh, whereas you would say some slower witted guy would be like the dwarfesses over here was the one this. Yeah, yep, yep, that clam. Them dwarfesses is back, you know, and they're 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 looking pretty mean, and they got toothpicks in their mouth, and they're carrying battle axes, and they're chopping down trees, making toothpicks, and they're heading this way. What do you think we should do about them dwarfesses, huh? That was the term, and that's the way it came across when she read it to me at first. I literally had to go back and re-listen to it a couple times to make sure I understood what was going on, which was really stupid of my my part because the whole world is populated by you know. 90% female. So everything there that he encounters is a woman. Like, I don't even think there was but one other male character in the story that I can think of right off the top of my head. And I might be wrong on that, but there was like only one male character in the story other than the main character's uh, first body takeover, absorption, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so he didn't really have to say dwarfesses or dwarfesses. He could have just said the lady dwarfs. Or he could have just said, basically, uh, the dwarves. I, I think the, the dwarves, it would have been implied or understood that they were female. And, and dwarfesses just did not hit my ears the right way. It was just bizarre. Um, I would have rather heard she dwarves or female dwarves or lady dwarves. Or they were, like I said, just plain old dwarves. Uh, and make it clear, you know, who he was referencing. And uh, It might have actually worked on the page. I don't know. But spoken aloud, it was mildly silly, and it just did not work. It bothered me to to an extent that I, I was not actually very happy with it. Now, speaking of out loud, let me just tell you, Dubois is clear and clean, but almost very robotic in her speaking. She had a very boring delivery style. I found her to be intently hard to listen to. She also has some mispronunciations. I'm not talking about the dwarfesses, okay? I'm talking about, I'll just call out one, okay? Let me just do that. I'll break it down so there's just one mispronunciation that you should be easily, easy to understand. It should be very easy to comprehend why I'm upset with this. Um, and, and I just want to say this. If you are going into a specific style of writing, a specific genre, you should familiarize yourself with this if you're going to be a reader. Because there are going to be words, like in sci-fi, there's technobabble. You know, there's going to be all kinds of gobbledygook that you've got to spew out like you know what you're talking about. It's going to be scientific. And it's going to have a, a very authoritative tone to it. In other words, it's going to be very realistic sounding. Even though it's all made up gibberish, you need to be able to say it properly. All right? And, and when you go into a field like fantasy... There are going to be fantasy monsters that you need to know what they are at first glance. You look at it, you know what it is, and then you, you run with it. You shouldn't have to stumble over that word or go figure it out. You really need to have yourself some sort of way of figuring out what words are. And she, she just does not do that here. Uh, and it bugged me. It's almost, and I'm, I hate to keep going back to Warden, you know, uh, <laughs> Nova Core Online, Warden, but... but when he they they kept saying you know uh, the end signs, that bugged me, and stuff like that drives me crazy because I'm a listener and it's just like if you were reading this book, and there was misspellings and grammatical errors, and and all that sort of stuff, it's gonna just jolt you out of the story as a reader. Well, as a listener, mispronouncing a word or saying a crazy word like dwarfesses will do that, and here. Dubois uses the pronunciation of like in place of the word lich. Now, if you know fantasy at all, a lich is an old undead spellcaster, old wizard, great and powerful sorcerer, whatever. They're old, they're skeletal, they're undead, and they cast spells. And they're called a lich, not a like. This was very irritating, and coupled with her style... Every little error that she made stood out like the Eiffel Tower on Liberty Island. It doesn't belong. And it just, it just made me nuts. Now, I've said it before and I'll say it again. Narration is a key to keeping your story interesting on Audible. Choosing a bad narrator is like shooting yourself in the foot. Yep, 
You might hobble along, but you're not going to win any races. And she crushed this story with her monotone, flat reading. She is not, by far, the worst I have ever heard. But man, she she just is maybe at the tail end of the middle of the pack. Uh, I mean, like I said, she's crisp, she's clean, she is clear, easy to understand, but she has no life in her story whatsoever. None. I mean, you know, there, she's middle of the pack. I can't even say that unless you're talking like a pack of cigarettes, okay? That's as far as I would go with it. No, she just barely makes that cut. Uh, I really struggled with this. I tried to figure out if it was a lit RPG book that wanted to be a Dungeon Core book or a Dungeon Core book that had lost its way or an erotic book that wanted to be... I mean, I really didn't know what it was supposed to be. There was just so many things that bounced up in the air. Uh, it was like Child was juggling this, that, and the other thing, and he thought he could put it all in there. And and it's nothing against Chow. Either you mesh your harem stuff really well. Again, I'll just go with what I'm reading right now. Dan the Barbarian. Excellent use of the... And I use the word harem lightly here because there's so far where I'm at, there's only been two women having sex. Uh, but I know it's going to grow. It's, it's a harem book. Um, the only thing that you can do is figure out where the pieces fit together how to put them in there right and line them up so they all work. And this just did not work. I mean, it was like, I'm going to put this in, I'm going to put this in, I'm going to put this in, I'm going to put this in. And instead of making this great, delicious stone soup, it just made this big mud pie. It was really weird the way things worked because I, I just I lost interest in the dungeon core. I, I lost interest in the, the sex scenes. I, it just there was too much going on and nothing was a focus that was properly there. There should have been more of a focus. It really should have. Um, and there was no real attempt at leveling or standard fare like stats and, you know, just abounding. Uh, it, it was what it was, but it just it lacked certain elements that it needed so badly. And I don't want to, you know, beat this down into the ground, but... As a Dungeon Core book, this was not it. I mean, if you're looking for Dungeon Core, don't do this because it was very undungeon y in, in every way you could have possibly been. And I try to say, man, you know, you did something new and different, and I like new and different. New and different is really exciting to me, um, especially when you take a genre and you flip it around and do something new. But here, flipping it around and then saying, well, we're not going to do this, this, and this, and we're just going to make all this happen. It did not make it exciting. It, it made it unsurprising and, and very run-of-the-mill. And that's where I'm going to say I'm going to give this 6.5 stars. Uh, again, it has a story, so I'm going to, I'm going to give it that. Uh, it, it does have a beginning, a middle, and an end that you could say it, it could keep your attention to it if you wanted it to. Um, some people, I know like myself, I if I hadn't had to do this and do this uh, show for you, I would have stopped the book, but I don't quit books, but I would have wanted to stop it. So, you know, for me, it's not my style. It's not my cup of tea, as I say. Uh, but here, it, it just was a, it was a 6.5 star, and that's the nicest I can do this uh, without getting even more belligerent with it, because it was not a dungeon book. It was more of something else. All right, next up is Steam. Whistle. What? Whistle. There we go. Alley. What are you doing back here, punk? Steam Whistle Alley. An adventure in augmented reality by Joshua Mason, narrated by Cena Breyer, with a book length of 11 hours and 47 minutes. I boarded the airship and looked around the interior. Just like the exterior, the dark woodwork was carved in reliefs of planets, stars, and galaxies. The seats, which had been vinyl in an uncomfortable shade of green last time I was on the bus, were now maroon plush cushions with elegantly crafted backrests and armrests. The conductor at the front of the cabin sported a striped suit jacket and pants, wire-rimmed glasses, and an impeccably kept white beard which tapered to a point halfway down his chest. Doors are closing, he boomed over the loudspeakers. Time waits for no one. Next stop, the Grand Stadiums. There were five other passengers in the cabin. 
four of which were the washed-out NPNCs. In the back left seat, however, sat a boy of perhaps seventeen, with gold-colored goggles perched atop a mass of curly red hair. His freckled face smiled as he saw me, and he waved me over. So I think that fans of steampunk should enjoy this book, but so will people who are not steampunk fans. I say it like that because I wasn't overwhelmed, or I should say rather overloaded, with a ton of steamy, punky kind of stuff. And that's because the book fluctuates between plain everyday reality as well as the augmented reality of the game. And that's what's really nice about this book, is that the game takes place in the real world. They go out and they actually interact in the real world. So I don't have that issue that I usually have, where the real world does stuff and then it takes place in the game world. I don't have that problem at all because everything takes place in the real world. So you can have intrigue in the real world as well as in the game world, and it balances out. So like I say, the steam is there, but it isn't super heavy. Uh, I really appreciated what Mason has done here, adding an element of real life to the game that is being played so that it's really not just a simple enter the VR realm by putting on a visor and lying in bed all day. You actually got to get up, get out, move around, and walk. So for people like me, who hates exercise and vegetables and uh, all that good stuff, uh, I wouldn't be playing this game. (laughs) Just being honest here, Joshua. Wouldn't be playing this game. Uh, I like to lay in bed all day. Um, I love how the goggles were used for the purpose in lieu of a dive tank. That was really neat. Um... And I think that he also is a big Blade Runner fan because there are hints of Blade Runner tech. For example, uh, what with the synthetic monkey Banjo. Uh, Banjo is the the main character Jakey's little pet, Uh, but he's not a real monkey. Well, he's a monkey in every way for the actual matter of things, except he's not a real monkey. He's synthetic. He was made. Uh, So I have to admit two things right here. Um, First... I'm a little bit leery of monkeys, and especially monkeys named Bingo, which is really close to Banjo, you know, Jake's monkey, after watching Space Ghost Coast to Coast years ago. I will never forget Brack's admonition, never trust a monkey, never, and I've never forgotten that, and I don't trust monkeys. You know, they come up and they bum cigarettes, and then they snatch your wallet, and they run away. You think they're all cute as they're dancing around grabbing peanuts and stuff? No, no, you'll lose a watch or a necklace or something. So you got to watch monkeys. Never trust them. Um, anyway, I get digressing, and I apologize. Our, our intrepid hero, Jakey, gets partnered with the gal of his dreams, uh, which just happens to be the girl that works at the coffee shop that he's been planning on asking out for a while. Uh, and when he goes to do it, she's disappeared, and that's because she's ended up being recruited by the same people that have recruited him which was nice for him, I guess. But he he's like one of the top players in the world, and she was a coffee shop girl. I don't know where her qualifications came in other than that she was maybe hot and the guy liked her. Uh, anyway, he also makes some friends along the way besides his girl. Uh, now, this was one of the things that I didn't like about the gameplay. Uh, the game creators choose your partner for you. And I don't care what algorithm you use. I don't want my gaming partner chosen by Tinder. I mean, you know... I don't even know which way you swipe when you know when you do that, but I know which way I wipe, but swiping I don't know the direction of. So, you know, here it doesn't make sense to me one way or the other why they pick somebody other than it was a, a kind of a plot device to put him and his girlfriend, wannabe girlfriend anyway, together as a surprise. And if I, I I'm spoiling things, I'm sorry, but I mean it's not that big of a shock uh, as you go through the book. It's really not that big a surprise. Um, anyway. Uh, see, my problem is, is I hate joining teams. I really do. Um, whenever I played any kind of game, I basically play them by myself. Whether it was WoW or, you know, Dark Age of Camelot or EverQuest, I always played alone. And getting to level 60 in WoW by myself really sucked. Really sucked. Uh, I just wish they made the gameplay where, you know, you could actually go out and play either by yourself or if you wanted to join a team, you could do it that way. I, I'm more of an individualist, uh, and I, I'm not a I'm not a group person. I just don't do well in teams. Um, and so for me, you know, that they had to pick a partner and add one to me, I'd have already been out of there. I'd have been done. Uh, again, that just took me, you know, 
too far into something I don't like to do. But that's my pet peeve, and that's my problem. It's not an issue with the book. Uh, that's the way it was done, and no one else really kind of complained about it so much. One thing that actually bothered me a little bit, I have to say, was the amount of time that it took to actually get into the game. Again, I think it was about 30% of the book before you get into Steam West Wiley. And I know if it wasn't 30%, it was dang close to 30% of the book uh, before we get into it. And, and I know that they finally got into it because everybody started shouting, welcome to Steam West Wiley, like six times before they got actually into going into the game, so to speak. So, you know, that's just one of those things that drives me crazy. If you're going to write a book about a game, get your people, your readers, your listeners into the game as soon as possible. And I understand you've got world building and you, you need to, you know, set things up and, and get people to know your characters. That's all well and good. But you need to do that within like the first 15% of the book, in my opinion, as a listener, because otherwise I really start just drifting away wondering when the hell we're going to get to the game. And I'm not talking about like, uh, we played this game first, and then when we stopped playing this game, we got into the new game. Because I don't care about the old game. The old game has no relevance on the new game at all. I want to see what's going to be done in Steam with Wally as opposed to, you know, in WoW. And, and I'm not saying he did that here, but I'm just saying, in, in general, get your readers or listeners into that book as fast as possible. It was a good while. We needed to get there quicker. Now, truth be told... Cena Breyer's narration really had to grow on me. There was just something really annoying about it at first, and I don't know why. Uh, it was like there was a nasally tone to everything that she did. It was, it's just very hard for me to describe. Uh, Breyer did really well with the narration itself, and it, it was really pretty clean and easy to understand. She did different voices to varying effect, and the pacing was excellent, but it took me almost two-thirds two-thirds of the book before I could listen and not be driven crazy by whatever her voice was doing to my ears. And, that, and that's weird for me to say that because either, either I really like a person's voice or I don't. And if I don't, I know why. And usually, just like with uh, Miss Dubois from the first book that I reviewed this week, her voice was very, very clear and very easy to understand, but it was also very drone-like in delivery. There was no life, no love, no nothing behind it, no emotion whatsoever. And it was just one thing after another, boom, 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 boom. That's how it sounded to me. Here, it, this was not the case. I, I thought that, you know, Cena really gave the characters life and emotion and paced things well. But it took me a long time before I, I got into her style. And and I, I know exactly what it was, is I, I was working. I got called out. I had to go change my clothes, turned it off for five minutes while I went and got my stuff and, and was ready to leave. And when I turned it on, it didn't bother me anymore. But I was really close to the end of the book. And I thought, wow, what happened? What was the difference? And I don't know. Um, but it did take me a little while to settle into her voice um, before I could listen. And like I say, she did great. Um, but it had nothing to do with her style or ability that was problematic. It just wasn't musical to my ears. But I acclimated, and then I didn't notice it anymore. So, anyway, here's the rundown. Here's the rundown on the, on the book itself. Jacob uh, gets a chance to alpha test a new game that takes place in augmented reality. That is, it takes place in the actual world, which means you're required to get off your fat butt and actually walk, explore, or fight outside with people. Outside. Not knowing what you're doing, but they see you acting all crazy wearing these goofy goggles. Now, considering I'm misanthropic, uh, you know, I'm a hermit who hates to leave the house, like I said before, I could already see I would be playing another game. But other people might actually like a little sunshine on their faces when they play. Uh, not me. I don't like sunshine. <laughs> but, but once he's in the game, he learns there are a couple of villainy types who are looking to take control of the game. And it comes down to Jake and his team to put the kibosh on them and their plans. The one's called the glitch, and the other, you know, he's just, he's one of those mustache twirly kind of guys. Um, and I'm not saying that in a negative way. That's just the way I, I pictured him whenever he would show up. You know, he was a snidely whiplash. <laughs> I'll get you and tie you to the, you know, the railroad tracks. Um, but, but there's bad guys in there, and they're, they're trying to do things in the game to take it over. Um, now, one of my favorite aspects of the story, uh, 
was it, it there was no and I'll say this as, as clearly as I can. There was no power leveling. There was no cheats. There were no backdoors. It was straight up gameplay grinding and honest leveling. I don't see that very often. I really don't. Uh, most times there's some cheat. There's some loophole. There's some extra ability that the, the hero has that lets him get away with something. In fact, the hero actually has something wrong that gives the villains power over him to a certain extent if he isn't careful. And, you know, he's a watchdog to that. But he actually has, you know, a detriment rather than an advantage in, in many ways in this game. And, and I like the fact that it was not like I started out at level one and by the end of the book I was level 65. I, I think that by the end of the book, if they were level four all the way around, I'm very surprised. I think it was level three, but it might have been four. So you're not seeing great leaps and bounds, you know, going through this um, play wise, you know, for the characters. They, they played the game. And they advanced just like a regular newbie would do. They had to go out and grind. And they had to fight. And they got killed by simple mobs. And it was nice to see that. I really, really enjoyed that. Now, my honestly, my only issue that I really took umbrage with in the book was the way the story ended. And, I, and it's a cliffhanger. I don't mind those. But the way it ended had some actual implications that I can't go into without giving my spoilers. Um... The implications weren't great for the characters. Uh, there was either this happened because somebody did something wrong or the, the, the bad guys did something to do something. So there, there's a lot of implications that I can't go in without giving away spoilers, and I'm sorry for that. But it still bothered me the way that ended, and I just was not happy with it. Um, either way, the book was fun, and I actually liked Banjo, even though I'd never trust him. Uh, and he was, more importantly not annoying. Um, he was one of the very few uh, animal sidekick or sidekick characters in general that did not annoy me to hell. Uh, I know, like, for example, the one book I talked about, the toad, uh, the little frog guy that kept running around and was just doing stuff. I just wanted to squash the toad or the frog or whatever it was. Just wanted to squish him. I hoped he died. I just prayed he would get killed. And it didn't happen. And I was very sad about that, that he survived. Here, Banjo was pretty neat and pretty cool, and I enjoyed him. Um, so the book, <coughs> excuse me, the book has a couple of things going for it. Uh, it's got cool characters, cool sidekicks, cool concepts. It's, it's got a good story to it, and I know I'd probably complain more about this than what I should have, but like I said, I call out what I think is wrong first, and then I'm going to tell you, like, the story was really good. It was fun. I thought it was pretty creative the way it was handled. Uh, and like I say, I enjoyed the book from start to finish. I just wish we had gotten into the book a little bit, I mean, the game a little bit quicker than what we did. But overall, the final score is a solid eight stars. I actually forgave the issues I had with the narration since I could find no flaws other than one part was repeated in the book. Uh, and that came when they were watching the gears within gears turning. Uh, and they were getting up to, like, the hillside or something like that. Um, and, and that same sentence is repeated twice. Other than that, everything else was spotless. And, you know, Cena Briar did a really good job. It just took me time to get used to her. So maybe next time I'll be able to handle her, her style a little differently. I really look forward to the next book. But it, it is a solid eight stars. And I don't want you to think my complaining through this uh, gives it a negative connotation whatsoever. I like the book a lot. I enjoyed it, but I had to get all that junk out of the way. All right, so finally for today, and I apologize again for the short length of this, this show, uh, the next book I want to do is Lost City, an epic lit RPG adventure by C.M. Carney, narrated by the amazing Armin Taylor, and a book length of 17 hours and 57 minutes. Griff stumbled back in shock. Something that wasn't the Balgroth had spoken to him, and it was none too pleased. The Balgroth smiled a wicked grin at Griff and charged. Panic took hold of Griff, and he thrust his hand out, mana filling his bracers. Behind the rumbling mack trunk of the Balgroth, his spear came to life and zipped to his hand. 
He stumbled to his feet, just in time to raise the spear in a lame defensive posture. The Balgroth's fist came crashing down upon Griff's upraised spear, and he barely kept his grip as it crushed him to his knees. It pushed down with much greater power than it had previously, and Griff knew his strength would soon fail him. And that's when help arrived. <clears throat> so I see no sophomore slump here. This book pretty much accelerates beyond the first book, which was excellent, by the way, and it only enhances the undercurrents of the first book. I was really surprised to see the role that the Arbolith are beginning to play in the series. I mean, it was a great villain in the first book. It was a great one-shot kill. You know, go back, and I'm sorry if you haven't read the first one. I'm probably giving away a little bit of a spoiler, but the Arbolith, you know, that he tackles, um, it just seemed to me like it was just every other run of the wheel run-of-the-mill monster that you, you would encounter in the dungeon crawl like that first book actually was. Um, however, the Arbolith are really beginning to take form as the real villains that they actually are. Uh, they are, to all you Star Trek fans out there, very akin to the Borg. You know, they come in, they take over your minds, and they control you in every way, shape, or form. Uh, so these are nasties from the other side of the universe, who plan on enslaving every sapient being in the realms. Very Borg-like, and I really like them a lot. You know, I'm a big D&D fan. I got into role-playing games way back when I was, in, you know, in school. Uh, my brother was in middle school when he ended up finding a D&D book on the ground, and we took that thing and dissected it for two weeks. And I said, without any rule book, without anything, we're going to play this game. I have it down. I know this thing cold. And we played it, and it was probably the best Dungeons & Dragons game we have ever played. Uh, bar none. It was the most fun, the most adventurous. Uh, it was the Lost City. Uh, it, was, it was a blast. And so this takes me back to that time in my life. This brings me back and reminds me of that moment you know, in my youth, my gosh, so many years ago, uh, you know, that, that this Dungeons and Dragons stuff came into being into my world. And I, I really thank, you know, Chris Carney for that, because this is an amazing book. And I love the Arboleth. Uh, they're excellent, excellent villains. And their little spawn are one of my favorite D&D character monsters ever. Um, but anyway, I'm digressing again. Griff, our hero, uh, who has the God's Head, uh, finds himself in the elven homeland and is given a quest to stop the seal of the Dwarven King from being used. And, of course, it is then promptly stolen from him. And he and his party, you know, you know, Tifla and Zag and, you know, just they all got to go out and stop this from taking place. So they have to chase after the thief uh, in order to stop an ancient force of indescribable power. And if I say that like that, you need to think of, like, Hellboy's Golden Army. So along the way, we're treated to some intense battles with ancient terrors, uh, uh, hints that chaos is also threatening the realm. And I don't mean, like, people are going crazy, doing crazy stuff. I mean, like, the personification of chaos is doing some horrible things. Uh, so there's that new threat that's come up. And there's also some tragedy that actually befalls the group. A tragedy that is very poignant and sad and completely unexpected. All I can say is, is Chris Carney, please do not undo what you have done. Stuff like this is necessary. It really is. Uh, and it shows that the stakes that are actually being played for are real. And that not everyone should get away unscathed or even alive. Uh, that's one of my favorite parts to a book is when a, a major character, you know, someone who's really integral to the party, they get ganked because you never see that. You know, if you want to see, like, really how to do that, look at Dragonlance. You know, they kill Flint and they kill, you know, well, I don't want to spoil it for anybody. They kill a lot of characters off. You know, not everybody that starts off in the adventure party makes it to the end of the third book and the in the series. Not everybody does. And and each death has meaning and value and impact to such an extent. I mean, I can remember when they, they died, I was physically overwhelmed. Uh, and, and here, again, I'm being taken back to my Dungeons & Dragons roots, or at least my TSR, 
because now I'm talking about Dragonlance. So you can see, you know, Carney has has a nice span. Um, he just he knocks it out of the park, and I was so glad to see that he killed somebody in the party. Um, is that a spoiler? You don't know who it is. It could be somebody new because there are new people. Mm, yes, new people. Um, anyway, some of my favorite parts come from Zeg, uh, <laughs> the demonic imp. Zeg, who may not be quite as impish as he seems. Uh, the way things look, Zeg might be a lot more powerful than first expected. Uh, I, I did like the riff in which, you know, fire made Zeg bigger. And, and I don't want to give anything away, but his relationship with the other demon in the party, Avernarius, also is not what you expect. And this is where I say Carney keeps pulling out stuff all the time and throwing it at you in ways that you don't expect. And you've really, honestly, got to pay attention to things that happen in his stories because he gives away a lot of stuff if you look and you listen uh, because there are clues about who is doing what, why they're doing it, how they're doing it. And if you pay attention, you might catch on. You just might catch on. I actually had got it just probably about a half an hour to an hour before the, the whole thing came came into being, uh, when it was all revealed. I, I had a really deep suspicion as to what was happening and, and who was responsible. And I, at least I sussed it out before, you know, it, it came free, uh, you know, in the book, so to speak. Um, so that was nice. Uh, we also, in this book, get to meet the world's, or I should say the realm's, most deadly Muppet, Erat, which means wrong, uh, who is a simple but powerful creature who defends the Dwarven city. Uh, my biggest issue comes with the super powerful army that, remember that golden army I talked about from Hellboy? Uh, if you remember Hellboy and you ever saw it, you know, they got destroyed and they were just like, boop, 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 and they were fine and they'd go back to smashing stuff. Well, these guys were supposed to be like this super destructive army that's been hidden away for 6,000 years. And, and my biggest beef is when they finally get into battle, they don't seem to be any more powerful than any other race in spite of their mind-numbing capabilities. So either they were overhyped or underwritten, and I don't know which it was, but I'm, I'm really not complaining. That's just, that was the story, and, and that's where he, he took it. So, you know, I just expected more of a show of force from them. Armin Taylor tells a tumultuous tale, and I must admit that I'm always impressed by him. I hate to say, but, you know, he is he is like this amazing book that you put on a shelf, and you only remember how good it is after you're rediscovering it when you're looking for something else. It's just sitting here, and you're like, holy crap, I haven't read this book in years, and this was so great. I love this book. And you, you take it down, and you're like, why did I forget this book? Because that's what I do with him. I mean, like, I love Armin Taylor. I listen to him on the VGO stuff, but after it's all said and done with, when I, when somebody says to me, "Hey, hey, um, who who are some great narrators? Can you rattle some off for me?" Invariably, I immediately go to Hayes and Podell and Daniels for the men. Okay, they just name a few, and Taylor never gets mentioned by me, never, and which is really sad because that's an oversight on my part because I love this guy's style. Um, his voice, his pacing, uh, and the punch that he adds to his readings. Needless to say, he nails this book down barehandedly while making it look like he was using a nail gun. The guy's incredible. Now, I will say this for Carney. The dude is not afraid to go big. And I mean huge. Huge. You have an entire pantheon <coughs> excuse me, of gods that are corrupted. And he has to, he has an I have to save my sister plotline, and she's one of the gods. There is the chaos is coming thread. There is the impending invasion by the prime, the Arbolith. And it, it makes me think of my cousin Vinny when Vinny's freaking out in his girlfriend, Mona Lisa. Uh, Lisa as she piles her issues on top of him and he freaks about out about all the other stuff on his shoulders. He's like, can you pile any more crap on my shoulders? And that's poor Griff, because Griff is facing a lot of huge things. And Carney does this impossible, impossible juggling act to make it seem like things aren't quite as bad as they look. They are horrible. They're horrible. 
at the end of the book, no matter what happens, whether they win or lose, if they survive, there's still all this other crap coming. It's just this big wave. And I know the next book will add more to what's coming. It's going to add more. And, and the characters are going to get overwhelmed. And it's brilliant because he keeps saying, go big or go home. And he is nowhere near his house. Nowhere. This cat is out in the wild. He is in BFE. Home is over here. He is on the other side of the world. He has gone big. He has gone far. He has gone exciting. And that's what I like. You know, his writing style, his characters, the direction of this series. All of them. I, I, I know I talked a lot about the first book, how good it was, and it was a dungeon crawl. And so I'm surprised, like, you know, here's this book. It starts off this way. You think it's going to go here, and it just becomes this massive dungeon crawl that just grows into something more. And here, they get out of the dungeon, and the crap gets even bigger and stinkier as they go. They can't get away from it. They cannot. And I, I just think, you know, Carney just does not have fear because I think I would be afraid to have five or six things hanging over my character's heads at any given moment, let alone, you know, what he has hanging over their heads. So my final score is do or do not. He, um, he has an 8.4 stars. And if you have to ask why, repeat view everything I just said, everything I just discussed. This is a powerhouse of a series. And I'm inclined to point this into the ranks like, you know, VGO, Ascend Online, War Returnus, Divine Dungeon, stuff like that. Uh, the book just keeps getting better. And now that there's two, it, it's, it's almost a full series. Uh, I don't know how far they're going to go in the book, if there's going to be five books in a series or whatever. But it's going to be an amazing series. This is just a killer killer piece of writing, of work, and of narration. So, you know, th this is just, it is ascending to new levels each time it comes out. I no longer have a fear that book three will be like kind of a drop because book two went upwards. And if you can go up over book one, which was amazing, then book three, I know he's got this. He, he is already back there shooting nothing but net. I mean, this cat, he can write. He can craft a story. And he can make the gameplay make sense. You know, he has his little cheats that are not cheats. You know, his little I'll save these five points for later thing. That's not a cheat. He figured something out and he earned those points throughout the book. And when they're used, they're used properly, efficiently, and rather wisely. So he's not using cheats. He's playing the game as it needs to be played. And again... Everything he does so far has been spot on, 100% right in my book. So if you really want a good book, go out and check this series out. It, it will not let you down. 8.4 stars. Well, that's our show, everyone. Thank you so very, very much for watching, everyone. I really appreciate you taking the time to watch or listen to the show. If you want to support us, you can like the Lit RPG Podcast Facebook page or the YouTube page or just like and share this video. I sincerely hope you've enjoyed the show. I really, really hope you've had a wonderful year. Uh, I do ask you, please leave your comments or suggestions in the comments below down there. You can see that down there, Gilbert. Uh, and feel free to tell me whatever you like. Uh, I enjoy the feedback. You can follow us always on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. And I would just like to add that this has been a really wonderful year for me. I started out doing this podcast and I had a short story come out in the VGOE anthology, and another one just came out in a new horror anthology that came out just before Christmas. I, I think I'm really blessed with being a part of this lit RPG community. And I have to say, I need to thank, you know, people like Jeff Hayes and Ramon Mia and James Hunter, who gave me my first break uh, with writing, uh, for the opportunities they've given me this year. Uh, they have made my 2018 very special, and I am deeply appreciative of everything that they have done for me. I can only hope for bigger and better things in 2019. I do ask, uh, remember, always leave a review for any book you have listened to or read. Authors really depend on reviews, and readers do as well. So, you know, if it's a great book, shout it to the heavens. If it's not so great, let everybody know. Uh, it's just a fair thing to do. For the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast, I'm Ray. Keep listening.